Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together on the 23rd of the eighth month on our creator's calendar, or the 6th of November, the 11th month, 2021, on the Gregorian calendar. And we are continuing in our reading of the recognitions of Clement, which is also called the Nazarene Acts of the Apostles. And it's really the teaching and preaching of Shimon Kepha, one of the taught ones of our Mashiach. We're currently on book two, and this is chapter 17, where we're covering Kepha and his taught ones talking about who he's about to have discourses with, Simon the Magician. So they had finished going over that, and now he's finishing up his conversation. This one is titled, Men Enemies to Yahuwah. But inasmuch as inborn affection towards Yahuwah the Creator seemed to suffice for deliverance to those who loved him, the enemy studies to pervert this affection in men and to render them hostile and ungrateful to their creator. For I call Shemaim and earth to witness that if Yahuwah permitted the enemy to rage as much as he desires, all men should have perished long ere now. But for his mercy's sake, Yahuwah does not suffer him. But if men would turn their affection towards Yahuwah, all would doubtless be delivered even if for some faults they might seem to be corrected for righteousness. But now, the most of men have been made enemies of Yahuwah, whose hearts the immoral one has entered and has turned aside towards himself the affection that Yahuwah the Creator had implanted in them, that they might have it towards him. <clears throat> but of the rest who seemed for a time to be watchful, the enemy appearing in a vision of esteem and splendor and promising them certain great and mighty things has caused their mind and heart to wander away from Yahuwah. Yet it is for some righteous reason that he is permitted to accomplish these things. To this Achilla answered, how then are men in fault if the immoral one transferring himself into the brightness of light promises to men greater things than the creator himself does? Then Kepha answered, I think, says he, that nothing is more unrighteous than this. And now listen while I tell you how unrighteous it is. If your son, whom you have trained and nourished with all care and brought to man's estate, should be ungrateful to you, and should leave you and go to another, whom perhaps he may have seen to be richer, and should show him the honor that he owed to you, and through hope of greater profit should deny his birth, and refuse you your parental rights, would this seem to you right or immoral? Then Achilla answered, it is manifest to all that it would be immoral. Then Kepha said, If you say that this would be immoral among men, how much more so is it in the case of Yahuwah, who above all men is worthy of honor from men, whose benefits we not only enjoy, but by whose means and power it is that we begin to be when we were not, and whom, if we please, we will obtain from him to be forever in Baraka, or blessedness. In order, therefore, that the untrustworthy may be distinguished from the trustworthy and the obedient from the disobedient, it has been permitted to the immoral one to use those arts by which the affections of every one towards the true father may be proved, meaning that Satan is allowed to tempt them because everyone is given free will messengers and men and of them some choose to do evil his inclination was to be evil and he's the one that goes around like a roaring liar seeking who he may devour if you recall 
But if there were in truth some strange Elohim, were it right to leave our own Elohim who created us and who is our father and our maker and to pass over to another? Yahuwah forbid, said Achilla. Then said Kepha, how then will we say that the immoral one is the cause of our sin when this is done by permission of Yahuwah? that those may be proved and condemned in the day of judgment who, allured by greater promises, have abandoned their duty towards their true father and creator, while those who have kept the true or the belief and the love of their own father, even with poverty, if so it has befallen, and with tribulation, may enjoy Shamayim gifts and immortal dignities in his Malkuth, or kingdom. But we will expound these things more carefully at another time. Meantime, I desire to know what Shimon did after this. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is chapter 19, Disputation Begun. And Nisita answered, When he perceived that we had found him out, having spoken to one another concerning his crimes, we left him and came to Zakai, telling him those same things that we have now told to you. But he receiving us most kindly, and instructing us concerning the belief of our Yah Master Yahushua Mashiach, has enrolled us in the number of the trustworthy, or faithful, the believers. When Nasita had done speaking, Zakai, who had gone out a little before, entered, saying, It is time, Kepha, that you proceed to the disputation, for a great crowd collected in the court of the house is awaiting you, in the midst of whom stands Shimon, supported by many attendants. Then Kepha, when he had heard this, ordering me to withdraw for the sake of prayer, for I had not yet been washed from the sins that I had committed in ignorance, said to the rest, Brothers, let us pray that Yahuwah, for his unspeakable mercy, through his Mashiach, would help me going out on behalf of the deliverance of men who have been created by him. Having said this, and having prayed, he went forth to the court of the house, in which a great multitude of people were assembled. And when he saw them all looking intently on him in profound silence, and Shimon the magician standing in the midst of them like a standard bearer, he began in the manner following. Shalom be to all who are prepared to give your right hands to truth. For whosoever are obedient to it seem indeed themselves to confer some favor upon Yahuwah, whereas they do themselves obtain from him the gift of his greatest bounty, walking in his paths of righteousness. So the first duty of all is to inquire into, his righteous, or into the righteousness of Yahuwah and his kingdom. His righteousness that we may be taught to act rightly. His kingdom, that we may know what is the reward appointed for labor and patience, in which Malkuth there is indeed a bestowal of ageless good things upon the good, or the Tob, but upon those who have acted contrary to the will of Yahuwah, a worthy infliction of penalties in proportion to the doings of every one. It becomes you, therefore, while you are here, that is, while you are in the present life, to ascertain the will of Yahuwah, while there is opportunity also of doing it. For if anyone, before he amends his doings, wishes to investigate concerning things that he cannot discover, such investigation will be foolish and ineffectual. And... Yeah. Sorry about Who's that. Fat? Let me pause it. Yes. Sorry about that. Lost my service real quick and had to come back. And just so we don't lose anything, 
we're going to start back at the beginning of the sentence here. And it says, this is Kepha speaking. Actually, I'll, I'll start over at the beginning. It says, Shalom be to all of you who are prepared to give your right hands to truth. For whosoever are obedient to it, seem indeed themselves to confer some favor upon Yahuwah, whereas they do themselves obtain from him the gift of his greatest bounty, walking in his paths of righteousness. So the first duty of all is to inquire into the righteousness of Yahuwah and his kingdom, his righteousness, that we may be taught to act rightly, his kingdom, that we may know what is the reward appointed for labor and patience, in which Malkuth, or kingdom, there is indeed a bestowal of ageless tobe things upon the tobe, or good, but upon those who have acted contrary to the will of Yahuwah, a worthy infliction of penalties in proportion to the doings of every one. It becomes you, therefore, while you are here, that is, while you are in this present life, to ascertain the will of Yahuwah, while there is opportunity also of doing it. For if anyone, before he amends his doings, wishes to investigate concerning things that he cannot discover, such investigation will be foolish and ineffectual. And this is the same thing that he was talking about before when he was just with his taught ones, saying that Simon the magician, because of his disposition, was not able to see the truth that was right in front of his eyes. And so he's re reiterating this to them, that until you amend your ways and you stop doing what you know to be wrong, you cannot comprehend these things correctly for the time is short and the judgment of yahuwah will be occupied with deeds not questions therefore before all things let us inquire into this what or in what manner we must act that we may merit to obtain ageless life and that's also reiterated in the Psalms and other places that the doing of them brings comprehension. When you obey, he gives of his Ruach. These things are said in different ways in a variety of places. <clears throat> chapter 12, or I'm sorry, chapter 11, righteousness, the way to the kingdom. For if we occupy the short time of this life with vain and useless questions, we will without doubt go into the presence of Yahuwah empty and void of good works. When, I have, when, as I have said, our works will be brought into judgment. For everything has its own time and place. This is the place, this the time of works. The world to come, that of recompenses that we may not therefore be entangled by changing the order of places and times, let us inquire in the first place what is the righteousness of Yahuwah, so that like persons going to set out on a journey, we may be filled with good works as with abundant provision, so that we may be able to come to the Malkuth of Yahuwah as to a very great city. For to those who think aright, Yahuwah is manifest even by the operations of the world that he has made, using the evidence of his creation, and therefore, since there ought to be no doubt about Yahuwah, we may have now to inquire only about his righteousness and his Malkuth. But if our mind suggests to us to make any inquiry concerning secret and hidden things, before we inquire into the works of righteousness, we ought to render to ourselves a reason. Because if acting well, we will merit to obtain deliverance. Then going to Yahuwah chaste and clean, we will be filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, or the set-apart Ruach, and will know all things that are secret and hidden, without any cavailing of questions. Whereas now, even if anyone should spend the whole of his life in inquiring into these things, 
he not only will not be able to find them, but will involve himself in greater errors because he did not first enter through the way of righteousness and strive to reach the haven of life. And therefore I advise that his righteousness be first inquired into, that pursuing our journey through it and placed in the way of truth, we may be able to find Yahushua, running not with swiftness, swiftness of foot, but with goodness of works, and that enjoying his guidance, we may be in no danger of mistaking the way. For if under his guidance we will merit to enter the city to which we desire to come, all things concerning which we now inquire we will see with our eyes, being made, as it were, heirs of all things. Comprehend, therefore, that the way is this course of our life. The travelers are those who do good works. The gate is Yahushua, of whom we speak. The city is the Malkuth in which dwells the Almighty Father, whom only those can see who are of a pure heart. Let us not then think to labor of this journey hard, or let us not then think the labor of this journey hard, because at the end of it, there will be rest. For Yahushua himself also from the beginning of the world, through the course of time, hastens to rest. And this is what our Mashiach meant by my father labors until now and I labor. And this is, if you realize that the creation account is a literal event that happened in six yamim or six days, but it's also literally a parable of his works through history, of his 22 works, just like the alphabet of the things he's doing in history to affect his will. They all go together, and that's what our Mashiach is laboring to accomplish until his rest or the millennial reign. So here's another witness for that. And Ava willing, we'll be able to go over that creation account pattern sometime soon. But it says, for he is present with us at all times. And if at any time it is necessary, he appears and corrects us that we may bring to ageless existence or life those who obey him. Therefore, this is my judgment, as also it is the pleasure of Yahushua that inquiry should first be made concerning righteousness by those especially who profess to profess that they know Yahuwah. If therefore anyone has anything to propose that he thinks better, let him speak, and when he has spoken, let him hear, but with patience and quietness. For in order to this at the first, by way of salutation, I prayed for shalom to you all. To this, Shimon answered, We have no need of your shalom. For if there be shalom and concord, we will not be able to make any advance towards the discovery of truth. For robbers and debauchees have shalom among themselves, and every immorality agrees with itself. And if we have merit, or sorry, and if we have met with this view that for the sake of shalom we should give assent to all that is said, we will confer no benefit upon the hearers. But on the contrary, we will impose upon them and will depart chavarim, or friends. So do not invoke shalom, but rather battle, which is the mother of shalom. And if you can, exterminate errors. And do not seek for friendship obtained by unfair admissions, for this I would have you know above all, that when two fight with each other, then there will be shalom when one has been defeated and has fallen. And therefore fight as best you can, and do not expect shalom without war, which is impossible, or if it can be obtained, show us how. And before we go on real quick, I, don't, I really don't need to make too many comments between this, because this is a real back and forth they were having. But I want you to be, be very mindful of the Ruach in them, the mannerisms of the magician versus Kepha. 
the way he acts, he tries to trip him up. He adds to his words. He misunderstands or comprehends the intentions. And he, he acts in an adversarial capacity, doing the things that Yahuwah hates from the heart. And Kepha acts in a manner that's loving, even to his enemies, patient, kind, gentle, giving, having the best intentions. All right, sorry about that. As I was saying, the characteristics that Kepha has is he's patient, he's kind, he's gentle, he's loving even towards his enemies, looking out for the best in others. And this is something you can see throughout their interactions together and how they behave. It's the intentions and the actions that they're doing, the words that they're saying, and the ways they're behaving. The more you're familiar with the Psalms and Proverbs or the renewed covenant writings about the characteristics on what believers should be like and what adversarial men are like, you, you can see this is actually walking it out. So we'll go ahead and continue. This is chapter 24, Kepha's explanation. To this Kepha answered, Hear with all attention, O men, what we say. Let us suppose that this world is a great plain, and that from two states whose kings or malachim are at variance with each other, two generals were sent to fight. And suppose the general of the Tob Melech, or good king, gave this command, or this counsel, sorry, that both armies should without bloodshed submit to the authority of the better Melech, whereby all should be safe without danger. But that the opposite general should say no, but we must fight, that not he who is worthy, but he who is stronger may reign with those who will escape. Which, I ask you, would you rather choose? I doubt not, but that you would give your hands to the better king, or better melech, with the safety of all. And I do not now wish, as Shimon says that I do, that a cent should be given for the sake of shalom to those things that are spoken amiss, but that the truth be sought for with quietness and order. For some, in the contest of disputations, when they perceive that their, errors is, or their error is confuted, immediately begin, for the sake of making good their retreat, to create a disturbance and to stir up strifes, that it may not be manifest to all that they are defeated. And therefore, I frequently entreat that the investigation of the matter in dispute may be conducted with all patience and quietness so that if perchance anything seem to be not rightly spoken, it may be allowed to go back over it and explain it more distinctly. For sometimes a thing may be spoken in one way and heard in another, while it is either advanced too obscurely or not attended to with sufficient care. And on this account, I desire that our conversation should be conducted patiently, so that neither should the one snatch it away from the other, nor should the unseasonable speech of the one contradicting erupt, interrupt the speech of the other, and that we should not cherish to desire, or sorry, the desire of finding fault, but that we should be allowed, as I have said, to go over again what has not been clearly enough spoken that by fairest examination, the knowledge of the truth may become clearer. For we ought to know that if anyone is conquered by the truth, it is not he that is conquered, but the ignorance that is in him, which is the worst of all demons, so that he who can drive it out receives the palm of deliverance. For it is our purpose to benefit the hearers, not that we may conquer badly, but that we may be well conquered for the acknowledgement of the truth. For if our speech is acuted, or yeah, acuted by the desire, ugh, I'm sorry. For if our speech is,
I did hit the record again button, so I'm just waiting for it to actually. Sorry about that. We have some weather issues, but we're going to try to have this go through as best we can. Start over on the. Yeah, I, yeah. I interrupt and give you. All right. Sorry about that. Like I said, the weather is having a little bit of hiccups, but we're going to go ahead and continue. Kef is still speaking. He says, for it is our purpose to benefit the hearers, not that we may conquer badly, but that we may be well conquered for the acknowledgement of the truth. For if our speech is actuated by the desire of seeking the truth, even although we will speak anything imperfectly through man's frailty, Yahuwah in his unspeakable tobim or goodness will fill up secretly in the comprehensions of the hearers those things that are lacking. It's not scrolling, beloved. Yeah, I noticed that. Just a moment. All right. For he is righteous, and according to the purpose of every one, he enables some to find easily what they seek, while to others he renders obscure even what is before their eyes. Since then, the way of Yahuwah is the way of Shalom. Let us with Shalom seek the things that are Yahuwah's. If anyone has anything to advance in answer to this, let him do so. But if there is no one who wishes to answer, I will begin to speak, and I, will, and I myself will bring forward what another may object to me and will refute it. When, therefore, Kepha had begun to continue his discourse, meaning he waited, but no one said anything, right? Shimon, interrupting his speech, said, Why do you hasten to speak whatever you please? I understand your tricks. You wish to bring forward those matters whose explanation you have well studied, that you may appear to the ignorant crowd to be speaking well but I will not allow you this subterfuge. Now, therefore, since you promise as a brave man to answer to all that anyone chooses to bring forward, be pleased to answer me in the first place. Then Kepha said, I am ready, only provided that our discussion may be with Shalom. Then Shimon said, do, you, do not you see, O simpleton, that in pleading for shalom, you act in opposition to your master, and that what you propose is not suitable to him who promises that he will overthrow ignorance. Or if you are right in asking shalom from the audience, then your master was wrong in saying, I have not come to send shalom on earth, but a sword. For either you say well, and he not well, or else if your master said well, then you not at all well. For you do not understand that your statement is contrary to his, whose Talmud or taught one you profess yourself to be. And here's something that you'll get a lot of throughout these discourses, questions and answers, different ways that I've even seen people answer or ask today about opinions on what these things mean in scripture how he can be seeming to be contrary in his statements, but have them make sense. And Kepha explains it very clearly, all of these things, if you just patiently listen to what it is, which is, I think, a great benefit for us. May I interject something here? Certainly. Do you want me to keep recording or pause? If, if I understand this, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. But what we see here is two different approaches towards enlightenment. Shimon wants to go to war and overcome you with his wisdom. And Kepha is saying, my master tells me to do it through peace. And well, it's actually love, love being or benevolence being the, the greatest force. He says, uh, benevolence will win over everything. And in opposition to the war, both are, are, are you're at, at odds with each other 
one with violence and one with love. That's that's right. And then one's with force and compulsory and oppression, and the other is with liberty and free will and of your own volition. So you're right. And that's why if you ever look into these things, not a topic for today, but the occultic, they, they only serve them through fear and intimidation and through illicit obligations, not through love or anything that is beneficial to a man because he's not. He's the contrary to everything that is beneficial to a man. It's just so. I, yeah, the, the word love, I, I know, Richard, you're very astute about some words that they need to be uh, properly stated. I would like to suggest that the word love is so abused and so uh, personal that we go to the word benevolent as disinterested benevolence. Uh, everybody is equal and everybody is, is uh, equal to receive the same amount of, of attention. Uh, even the Shimon, he'll go to him with that same benevolence, not to defeat him, but to inform him and hopefully save him. Right. So benevolence is a much better word than love in our culture anyhow. That's sorry. Right. No, you're fine. It's just when that's the thing I was talking about. Whenever we anything that it's in reality, we have to look to what does his word say? And so when we do have to define things, and when I say love, I'm thinking of first Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient, benevolence, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking. Love keeps no records of wrongs. It does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always covers. It always trusts. It always expects. It always endures. Love never fails. That's the only definition and anything related to it in his word that goes with that for what we should comprehend as when we speak that word love and that benevolent kindness, what you're, what you're talking about, that's, that's similar. It's the same thing. But that's the meaning that that he gave and that's what we have to take from it if we're not doing that then you can call it love but that's not the truth that's just a delusion and if you find yourself in opposition to the person across from you and you feel any anger towards them you've lost it go back and start over well that's he's as you, worthy yeah. to hear the truth as you Right. And see, that's when he says, when if you have hatred in your heart, you, you're walking in darkness and you haven't seen the light. Right. Just what he said. Right. It all goes together. Thank you for that, brother. Yep. <clears throat> all right. So um, but please tell me if I overstep myself. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. This is well, this I'm the new story. guy here. I don't know what all the ground rules are. We, we don't really have ground rules I'm aware of other than we're all trying to learn. We're all sharing when it comes to our heart. You're, you're, you're just fine. Some people. We're all here quiet. to share iron sharpening iron. That's right. All right. So um, we'll continue here. This is chapter 27 questions and answers. And it, Shimon just asked that question about how he can be contrary to his master and gave those two examples with him saying that he didn't come to send shalom but a sword so then kepha said neither he who sent me did a miss in sending a sword upon the earth nor do i act contrary to him in asking shalom of the hearers but you both unskillfully and rashly find fault with what you do not understand for if you have heard that our master came not to send shalom on earth, but that he also said, prosperous or ashray are the shalom makers, for they shall be called the very sons of Yahuwah, you have not heard. So my sentiments are not different from those of the master when he recommended shalom. 
to the keepers of which he assigned blessedness or baraka. Then Shimon said, in your desire, see, so he's not looking to be peaceable or comprehend. He's looking to trip him up, right? The adversarial position here. Then Shimon said, in your desire to answer for your master, O Kepha, you have brought a much more serious charge against him. If he himself came not to make shalom, yet enjoined upon others to keep it. Where then is the consistency of that other saying of his? It is enough for the taught one to be as his master. Or sorry, it is enough for the taught one that he be as his master. To this, Kepha answered, our master Yahuwah, Yahushua, or I'm sorry, our master Yahushua, he, it is, he is called Yahuwah, Yahushua elsewhere in the text here, but that's not right here. Our master Yahushua, who is the Nabiya Emmet, or true foreteller, and ever mindful of himself, neither contradicted himself nor enjoined upon us anything different from what he himself practiced. For whereas he said, I am not come but to send, or I am not come to send shalom on earth, but a sword. And henceforth you will see father separated from son, son from father, husband from wife, and wife from husband, mother from daughter, and daughter from mother, brother from brother, father in law from daughter in law, friend from friend. All these contain the halakha or path of shalom. And I will tell you how. At the beginning of his preaching, as desiring to invite and lead all to deliverance, he induced them to bear patiently labors and trials. He baruch, or blessed the poor, and promised that they should obtain the Malkuth Shemaim for their endurance in poverty, in order that under the influence of such a hope, or expectation, they might bear with equanimity the right of poverty, despising covetedness, for covetedness is one and the greatest of most pernicious sins. But if he promised also that the hungry and the thirsty should be satisfied with ageless birak oath or blessings of righteousness, in order that they might bear poverty patiently, and not be led to, by it to undertake any unrighteous work. In like manner also, he said that the pure in heart are prosperous, and that thereby they should see Yahuwah, in order that everyone desiring so great a good might keep himself from evil and polluted thoughts. Chapter 29, Shalom and Strife. Thus, therefore, our master, inviting his Talmudim, or taught ones, to patience, impressed upon them that the Baraka of Shalom was also to be preserved with the labor of patience. So, an, a manifestation of showing love. Right? If you remember chapter 13, 1 Corinthians, right? But on the other hand, he mourned over those who lived in riches and luxury, who bestowed nothing upon the poor, proving that they must render an account because they did not pity their neighbors, even when they were in poverty, whom they ought to love as themselves. And by such sayings as these, he brought some indeed to obey him, but others he rendered hostile. The believers, therefore, and the obedient he charges to have shalom among themselves, and says to them, prosperous, or ashray, are the shalom makers. It says blessed here, but when you look like in the hallelujah version, they quite often put blessed where the word is ashray. They do it in the Psalms as well, Psalm 1, Psalm 119. They'll put blessed instead of ashray. And the word, while it does mean to be blessed, it also has more significance. It, it's literally to be he who or that which is confirmed, authenticated, and strengthened 
you're happy and prosperous because you're walking straight. So it's a conditional thing on what you're doing that makes you prosperous. But it's prosperous. Ashray are the shalom makers. So they're prosperous for doing, right? For they will be called the very sons of Yahuwah. <clears throat> but to those who not only did not believe, but set themselves in opposition to his halakha or path, he proclaims the war of the word and of confutation. And says that henceforth you will see son separated from father, and husband from wife, and daughter from mother, and brother from brother, and daughter-in-law from mother-in-law, and a man's foes will be they of his own house. For in every house, when there begins to be a difference between believer and unbeliever, there is necessarily a contest. The believer, sorry, the unbelievers on the one hand, fighting against the belief and the believers on the other, confuting the old error and the vices of sins in them. In like manner also, during the last period of his teaching, he wages war against the scribes and Pharisees, charging them with evil deeds and unsound doctrine, and with hiding the key of knowledge, that they had handed down to them from Moshe, by which the gate of the Shemaim Malkuth may be opened. A lot of people take this phrase and they make it to mean certain things. Like I've heard, as an example, that the key of knowledge is the name of Yahuwah. And people have a lot of ideas about that, but it's not anywhere expressly written that that's what that means. However, our Mashiach had mentioned that they hide the key of knowledge from people and so they don't know the truth. And right here, Kef is explaining that the, the, the key is the knowledge. It's the key of knowledge, the knowledge of the truth, which is in the word. They hide from the people so that they don't act accordingly. That's what that's about. But... When our master sent forth or sent us forth to preach, he commanded us that into whatsoever city or house we should enter, we should say, Shalom be to this house. And if, said he, a son of Shalom be there, your Shalom will come upon him. <clears throat> but if there be not, your Shalom will return to you. Also, that going out from that house or city, we should shake off upon them the very dust that adhered to our feet. But it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city or house. And this is the thing that our Mashiach said. Before I came, they have no sin. Now that I have come, there is no excuse for their sin. This is literally in what he meant but it's also in a practical application. When the truth is brought to a people, before that time, they're in ignorance, they're doing things that aren't beneficial. Once the truth comes, if they turn from that, all of that's not counted against them because it was in ignorance that it was attributed to. And these are things that you see in Ezekiel and throughout the renewed covenant, this is the theme. If you turn from wickedness, you do right and righteousness, he's not gonna impute what you did before against you. But when, when once the truth comes, if you hear these things, if you see the, the words of his taught ones, then you argue against it. That's when you're going to be rightly held accountable for the judgment that you have in store. That's the difference between there's different levels of sin, transgression, and inequity, right? To sin is to do anything that's against the Torah, whether in ignorance or otherwise, but it's really, a, it's not intentional to Peshaz transgress, it's to break trust. You break trust with those that are someone you should have a, a, a built trust with, but it requires that relationship. And then Awan or Avon, they call it, is inequity. And that's what you see, what you intend, what you maliciously, in, what you comprehend that is wrong, that you do. And it's the inequity that 
he would bear for us, but because we don't follow him, he causes us to bear our own. <clears throat> and it's the inequities that are handed down to the children, to the third and fourth of those who hate him. Perfect example is in Manasseh, his son, or he was the son of Yehe, or he was the son of Hezkiel, who was righteous. He had been sick and prayed and was given longer life. His reign after most of Yahuda was plundered by the Assyrians for their evil. They had 185,000 man army, or it could have been just the leaders of the army, based on which account scripture of Josephus you, you're reading. But they had a 185,000 man army that was completely wiped out because he prayed for deliverance and the people were humble. Anyways, uh, the, the point is, he knew the truth. His son, who should have known better, did all these evils, intentionally set up idolatries and things that he would, they should have known better. And it was because of that, that Yahuwah would not forgive the inequity, and he was going to wipe the place out, completely destroy the place because of the stuff that he had set up in it, right? So there's different levels of evil. And when you're doing what you know to be wrong, that's, that's the worst kind. You can repent of it, but you will by no means be unpunished, is what he says. And that's just like what our Mashiach says, to whom much is given, much is expected. And the more you have, the more you're held accountable for. So to continue, he says, this indeed he commanded to be done at length. If first the word of truth be preached in the city or house, whereby they who receive the belief of the truth may become sons of Shalom and sons of Yahuwah. And those who will not receive it may be convicted as enemies of Shalom and of Yahuwah. Thus, therefore, we, observing the commands of our master, first offer shalom to our hearers, that the way of deliverance may be known without any tumult. <clears throat> but if anyone does not receive the words of shalom, nor acquiesce in the truth, we know how to direct against him the war of the word, and to rebuke him sharply by confuting his ignorance and charging at home upon him his sins. Therefore, of necessity we offer shalom, that if anyone is a son of shalom, our shalom may come upon him. But from him who makes himself an enemy of shalom, our shalom will return to ourselves. We do not, therefore, as you say, propose shalom by agreement with the immoral, for indeed, we should straight away have given you the right hand. And this is something that I, I've never been too cognizant of. It's my, it's been a custom as long as I've grown up, you greet someone by shaking their hand in this country. That's a normal thing. Here, it was a custom that you would be familiar and shake hands with those that you, were, you knew. And there's a whole Middle Eastern custom it's something we can talk about some other time, but our Mashiach talks about it. It's also mentioned either with Eli Shah, or I believe it's Eli. Yeah, it's Eli Shah or Eli Yahu, but I believe it's Eli Shah, where they're sent and they're not supposed to greet anyone in the way. It doesn't mean that you don't say hello as you're passing by, but they had a custom where they would stop and they'd do these long ornate greetings and they'd have a chat and they'd sit there and take a long time to, it wasn't a quick event. And that was what was being prohibited because they were messengers with a mission, right? <clears throat> but right here, he's saying that you wouldn't even give his right hand to, to someone until they were in agreement. But only in order that through our discussing quietly and patiently, it may be more easily ascertained by the hearers which one is the true speech. But if you differ and disagree with yourself, how will you stand? He must of necessity fall, who is divided in himself. For every Malkuth or kingdom divided against itself will not stand. If you have anything to say to this, say on. Then said Shimon, I am astonished at your folly. 
For you so propound the words of your master as if it were held to be certain concerning him that he is a foreteller, while I can very easily prove that he often contradicted himself. In short, I will refute you from those words that you have yourself brought forward. For you say that he said that every Malkuth or every city divided in itself will not stand. And elsewhere, you say that he said that he would send a sword, that he might separate those who are in one house, so that son will be divided from father, daughter from mother, brother from brother, so that if there be five in one house, three will be divided against two, and two against three. If then everything that is divided falls, he who makes divisions furnishes causes of falling. And if he is such, assuredly he is immoral. Answer this if you can. Then Kepha, <clears throat> do not rashly take exception, O Simon, or Shimon, against the things that you do not comprehend. In the first place, I will answer your assertion that I set forth the words of my master and from them resolve matters about which there is still doubt. Our master, when he sent us sent ones, the Sheliachim is what he calls the apostles, emissaries, or literally means to be sent out or sent ones. When he sent us sent ones to preach, enjoined us to teach all tribes the things that were committed to us. We cannot therefore speak those things that were spoken by him, for our commission is not to speak, but to teach those things, and from them to show how every one of them rests upon truth. Nor again are we permitted to speak anything of our own. There another not going beyond what was written or what they're told, right? For we are sent, and of necessity, he who is sent delivers the message as he has been ordered, and sets forth the will of the sender. For if I should speak anything different from what he who sent me enjoined me, I should be a false shaliach, or sent one, not saying what I am commanded to say, but what seems good to myself. Whoever does this evidently desires to show himself to be better than he or better than he is than the one by whom he is sent, and without doubt is a traitor. If, on the contrary, he keeps by the things that he is commanded and brings forward most clear assertions of them, it will appear that he is accomplishing the work of a sent one. And it is by striving to fulfill this that I displease you. Blame me not, therefore, because I bring forward the words of him who sent me. But if there is aught in them that is not fairly spoken, you have liberty to confute me. But this can in no wise be done, for he is a foreteller and cannot be contrary to himself. But if you do not think that he is a foreteller, let this first be inquired into. Then said Shimon, I have no need to learn this from you, but how these things agree with one another. For if he will be shown to be inconsistent, he will be proved at the same time not to be a foreteller. Then says Kepha, but if I first show him to be a foreteller, it will follow that what seems to be inconsistency is not such. For no one can be proved to be a foreteller merely by being or merely by consistency, because it is possible for many to obtain this. But if it, but if consistency does not make a foreteller, much more inconsistency does not. Because therefore there are many things that to some seem inconsistent, which yet have consistency in them on the more profound investigation as other things, or as also other things that seem to have consistency, but which, being more carefully discussed, 
are found to be inconsistent. For this reason, I do not think there is any better way to judge of these things than to ascertain in the first place or in the first instance whether he be a foreteller who has spoken those things that appear to be inconsistent. For it is evident that if he be found a foreteller, those things that seem to be contradictory must have consistency, but are misunderstood. Concerning these things, therefore, proofs will be properly demanded. For we sent ones are sent to expound the sayings and affirm the judgments of him who has sent us. But we are not commissioned to say anything of our own, but to unfold the truth, as I have said, of his words. Then Shimon said, Instruct us, therefore, how it can be consistent that he who causes divisions, which divisions cause those who are divided to fall, can either seem to be good or to have come for the deliverance of men. Then Kepha said, I will tell you how our master said that every Malkuth and every house divided against itself cannot stand. And whereas he himself did this, see how it makes for deliverance. By the word of truth, he certainly divides the Malkuth of the world, which is founded in error, and every home in it, that error may fall and truth may reign. But if it should be in any house that error, being introduced in anyone, divides the truth, then where error has gained a footing, it is certain that truth cannot stand. Then said Shimon, but it is uncertain whether your master divides error or truth. Then Kepha, that belongs to another question. But if you are agreed that everything that is divided falls, it remains that I will show you, if only you will hear in Shalom, that our Yahushua has divided and dispelled error by teaching truth. Then said Shimon, do not repeat again and again your talk of shalom, but expound briefly what it is you think or believe. Kepha answered, Why are you afraid of hearing frequently of shalom? For do you not know that shalom is perfection of Torah? For wars and disputes spring from sins, and where there is no sin, there is shalom of inner beings. But where there is shalom, truth is found in disputations, righteousness in works. So once we have a shalom by not being sinful, we determine the truth by talking about it and righteousness in what we're doing. Right? Then Shimon said, you seem to me not to be able to profess what you think. Then Kepha, I will speak, but according to my own judgment, not under constraint of your tricks. For I desire that that which is salutary and profitable be brought to the knowledge of all, and therefore I will not delay to state it as briefly as possible. There is one Yahuwah, and he is the creator of the world, a righteous judge, rendering to everyone at some time or other according to his deeds. But now for the assertion of these things, I know that countless thousands of words can be called forth. Then Shimon said, I admire indeed the quickness of your wit, yet I do not embrace the error of your belief, for you have wisely foreseen that you may be contradicted. And you have even politely confessed that for the assertion of these things, countless thousands of words will be called forth. You see, Kepha said can. Shimon twists what he says to say will. Because he's not standing on truth. He has to work in ways that the adversary does, which is not to build or to create, but to kill, steal, and destroy. Right? or to be adversarial. 
He says, thousands of words will be called forth for no one agrees with the profession of your belief. In short, as to there being one Yahuwah and to the world being his work, who can receive this doctrine? Neither, I think, any one of the pagans, even if he be an unlearned man, and certainly no one of the philosophers, but not even the rudest and most wretched of the Yahudim, nor I myself, who am well acquainted with their Torah. Then Kepha said, put aside the opinions of those who are not here, and tell us face to face what is your own. Then Shimon said, I can state what I really think, but this consideration makes me reluctant to do so. That if I say what is neither acceptable to you nor seems right to this unskilled rabble, you indeed, as confounded, will straightway shut your ears, that they may not be polluted with blasphemy, forsooth, and will take to flight because you cannot find an answer, while the unreasoning populace will assert assent to you and embrace you as one teaching those things that are commonly received among them, and will curse me as professing new things and unheard of, and instilling my error into the minds of others. Then Kepha, are you not making use of long preambles, as you accused us of doing, because you have no truth to bring forward? For if you have, begin without circumlocation, or without beating around the bush, right? If you have so much confidence, and if indeed what you say is displeasing to any one of the hearers, he will withdraw. And those who remain will be compelled by your assertion to approve what is true. Begin, therefore, to expound what seems to you to be right. Then Shimon said, I say that there are many Elohim, but that there is one incomprehensible and unknown to all and that he is the Elohim Hagadol, or the high, the, the greatest Elohim of all these Elohim. Then Kepha answered, This Elohim Hagadol, whom you assert to be incomprehensible and unknown to all, can you prove his existence from the scriptures of the Yahudim, which are held to be of authority? or from some others of which we are all ignorant, or from the Greek authors, or from your own writings. Certainly, you are at liberty to speak from whatever writings you please, yet so that you first show that they are foretelling or prophetic, for so their authority will be held without question. Now, Kepha says that the scriptures of the Yahudim are held to be of authority, and this would have been a fact that was evident at their times because it would have been almost um, almost 300 years that you would have had the scriptures both in Greek and Hebrew. So it would have been known about the beast reigns that were in occupation before, during, and coming while they were living that out. And they would have seen it in truth themselves the, the the foretellings of daniel were given and then it was translated is my point that's what he's speaking of they were known in the world by those who took time to seek those things to be of authority of showing what was going to come in the future <clears throat> and then listen to what shimon simon the magician says in response to that right this is very interesting but Kepha goes on to say real quick, certainly you are at liberty to speak from whatever writings you please, yet so that you first show that they are prophetic or foretelling, for so their authority will be held without question. Then Shimon said, I will make use of assertions from Torah of the Yahudim only, for it is manifest to all who take interest in obedience that this Torah is of universal authority, yet that every one receives the comprehension of this Torah according to his own judgment. 
we all have to decide at the bar of our own reason the truth that is contained in the scriptures. We cannot yield our reason to another man. We have to assert or assent to what is written or else we're giving someone else's our authority. That This is something that's even coming out of the mouth of the unrighteous here. But again, and you'll see this more and more, while he clearly professes things that are true, he does not comprehend the very things that he professes. But here he goes, says, for it has so been written by him who created the world that the belief of things is made to depend upon it. Hence, whether anyone wishes to bring forward truth or anyone to bring forward falsehood, no assertion will be received without this Torah. Inasmuch, therefore, as my knowledge is most fully in accordance with Torah, I rightly declared that there are many Elohim, of whom one is more eminent than the rest and incomprehensible. Even he who is Elohim Hagadol, or the high Elohim of Elohim. But that there are many mighty ones, Torah itself informs us. For in the first place, it says this in the passage where one in the figure of a serpent speaks to Hua, or Eve, the first woman. On the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will be as Elohim. That is, as those who made man. And after they had tasted of the tree, Yahuwah himself testifies, saying to the rest of the Elohim, Behold, Adam is become as one of us. Thus, therefore, it is manifest that there were many Elohim engaged in the making of man. Also, whereas at the first Yahuwah said to the other Elohim, let us make man after our image and likeness, and also his saying, Let us drive him out, and again, come, let us go down and confound their language. All these things indicate that there are many Elohim, but this also is written, You will not curse the Elohim, nor curse the chief of your people. And again, this writing, Yahuwah alone led them, and there was no strange Elohim with them, shows that there are many Elohim. There are also many other testimonies that might be adduced from Torah, not only obscure but plain, by which it is taught that there are many Elohim. One of these was chosen by Lot, that he might be the El of the Yahudim. See, so you see, he takes things that are in scripture and then he adds his own opinions. He adds it. No one says that he was that a lot was chosen by Yahuwah to get him. That's nowhere written. But he takes the things that are written, not comprehending them correctly, and then adds to or takes from and twists things. And that's the satanic, that's the fruits of the adversary that twist the comprehension. This is why Shaul says we're not supposed to think beyond what is written. It says, but it is not of him that I speak, but of that Elohim Hagadol, who is also his Elohim, whom even the Yahudim themselves did not know. For he is not their Elohim, but the Elohim of those who know him. When Kepha had heard this, he answered, fear nothing, Shimon. For behold, we have neither shut our ears nor fled, but we answer with words of truth to those things that you have spoken falsely, asserting this first, that there is one Elohim, even the Yahuwah of the Yahudim, who is the only Elohim, the creator of Shemaim and earth, who is also the Elohim of all those whom you call Elohim. 
if then I will show that you or I will show you that none is superior to him, but that he himself is above all, you will confess that your error is above all. Then Shimon said, why indeed, though I should be unwilling to confess it, would not the hearers who stand by charge me with unwillingness to profess the things that are true? And then this is the answer continued. I'm waiting for it to catch up here just a moment. Sorry about that. All right, listen then, says Kepha, that you may know, first of all, that even if there are many Elohim, as you say, they are subject to the Yahuwah of the Yahudim, to whom no one is equal, then whom no one can be greater. For it is written that the foreteller Moshe thus spoke to the Yahudim, Yahuwah your Elohim is the Elohim of Elohim, and the master of masters, the great Yahuwah. Thus, although there are many that are called Elohim, yet he who is the Yahuwah of the Yahudim is alone called the Elohim of Elohim. For not everyone that is called Elohim is necessarily Elohim. Indeed, even Moshe is called an Elohim to Pharaoh, and it is certain that he was a man. And judges, Shofetim, right? And judges were called Elohim, and it is evident that they were mortal. The idols also of the Goyim, or nations, are called Elohim, and we all know that they are not. But this has been inflicted as a punishment on the immoral, that because they would not acknowledge the true Elohim, they should regard as Elohim whatever form or image should occur to them. Because they refused to receive the knowledge of the one who, as I said, is Elohim of all. Therefore, it is permitted to them to have as Elohim those who can do nothing for their worshipers. For what can either dead images or living creatures confer upon men, since the power of all things is with one? And I don't know of any other reference except for the apostolic constitutions that alludes to what you can read in Bell and the Dragon, but right here is a really quick, real good one. If you're not familiar, the, the apocryphal work known as in the Greek Septuagint as the additions to Daniel. One of them is called Bell and the Dragon. The other one's called Susanna. Bell and the Dragon has to do with the time when Daniel was living in the era of Koresh when he was older and he overthrows the idol Baal, the statue or the image, and also a living creature, a dragon that they worshiped at that place. <clears throat> And if you're familiar with the walls of Babylon, they have the, the depictions of dragons and things of that nature. They literally had a giant lizard there that they worshiped too. Daniel had it kill itself by, well, you can read about it there, but it was a brute animal that he proved wasn't a mighty one. So here's the continuation of the explanation from Kepha about what is called Elohim. <clears throat> Therefore, the title Elohim is applied in three ways, either because he to whom it is given is truly Elohim, or because he is the servant of him who is truly, and for the honor of the sender, that his authority may be full, he that is sent is called by the name of him who sends, as is often done in respect of Melachim, messengers right? And before we, before we move on real quick, I want to show you another picture of that where our, our Mashiach is like the image of the father, a hand in the glove, hand in the glove kind of thing. Because the only true Elohim is Yahuwah the father. But his son is El the word. He is sent by him and he is his servant and he is called Elohim in honor of the sender. 
that his authority may be full. It's that exact picture, speaking of our Mashiach, because he even said himself that the Father is the only true Elohim. But he's called Elohim in this very capacity. And then as an image of that, because he only does what he sees done, and he only, hear, and he only says what he, sa he hears said, he sends Moshe, and his sent one is also called an Elohim to the ones that he sent as a picture of what would come. So, <clears throat> and I don't know if you're familiar, I think I mentioned it before, in the visions of Amram, which is in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's the, like the testament of Amram, if you will, he records Moshe's name as Melech Yahu, or the messenger of Yahuwah. That was his name before it was named Moshe by the Egyptian woman, which is to be drawn out of the waters. And both of those titles apply as the, like the one who is coming like him. He was the messenger Yahuwah who was drawn out of the waters. So they all, it all ties together. <clears throat> but for when they appear to a man, this is speaking of the messengers in, in general that are over the peoples, right? For when they appear to a man... If he is wise and intelligent man, he asks the name of him who appears to him, that he may acknowledge at once the honor of the sent and the authority of the sender. For every tribe has a melech or a messenger to whom Yahuwah has committed the government of that tribe. And when one of these appears, although he be thought to be called Elohim by those over whom he presides, Yet being asked, he does not give such testimony to himself. For Yahuwah El Shaddai, who alone holds the power of all things, has divided all the tribes of the earth into 72 parts. So if you remember, Moshe was the one, went to the 12, and they had the 72 with the elders. Our Mashiach came, he was the one who got the 12, and then the 72 taught ones. And then in that same capacity, you go back to the beginning, Adam was the one, he had 12 sons, and then they had 72 families. And that was this, it, afterwards, it also breaks up into that same pattern where you have the 72. So it's a repeating cycle pattern that you can see happen. But this is all reflecting truth. It's pointing out the true things. And in this capacity, there's 72 families in the world over whom these messengers are given dominion. And the one family, Abraham's seed through Yitzhak and Yaakov, the 12 tribes specifically and exclusively, which is always and has always been the literal descendants and those who sojourn with them but it's only those who are of the circumcised heart, not always just the literal seed. So it's not always, it's, it's the same consistent pattern. It's never been different. Abraham had many that were with him. All those circumcised in his house were of his, of his people, whether they were literal seed or not. The point being, these were 72 over all the other peoples, Mikael over his people, which he alone leads, but he puts his prince or his chief messenger over them. You find more information about that when you're looking at the shepherd of Hermas. But just to finish real quick, it says, For Yahuwah El Shaddai, who alone holds the power of all things, has divided all the tribes of the earth into 72 parts. And over these, he has appointed Melakim or messengers as princes, Sarim, but to the one among the chief messengers who is greatest, which is Mikael, literally means who is like El, right? He committed the government of those who before all others received the worship and knowledge of Yahuwah El Shaddai, but devoted men also, as we have said, are made Elohim by the immoral, as having received the power of life and death over them, as we mentioned above with respect to Moshe and the judges. 
So it is also written concerning them. You will not curse the Elohim. You will not curse the Shar or Sar prince of your people. Thus the Sarim of the several tribes are called Elohim. And this is what's alluded to in Deuteronomy 32, where it says when Yahuwah made the nations that he separated them according to the number of the children of Elohim. In the Masoretic text, it says the number of the children of Yisrael, but in the other versions, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's, it says the children of Elohim, and now you get the context. Those are the messengers over whom he gave dominion for those tribes. But Mashiach is sovereign of Sarim, who is judge of all. Therefore, neither messengers nor men nor any creature can truly or can be truly Elohim. For as much as they are placed under authority, being created and changeable, messengers, for they were not and are, men, for they are mortal, and every creature, for it is capable of dissolution. If only he dissolve it who made it. And therefore he alone is Elohim Emmet, or the true Elohim, who not only himself lives, but also bestows life upon others, which he can also take away when it pleases him. So the scripture exclaims in the name of the Yahuwah of the Yahudim, saying, Behold, behold. Seeing that I am Yahuwah and there is none else apart from me, I will kill and I will make alive, I will smite and I will heal, and there is none who can deliver out of my hands. See therefore how by some ineffable virtue the scripture opposing the future errors of those who should affirm that either in Shamayim or on earth, there is any Elohim besides him who is the El of the Yahudim, decides thus, Yahuwah your Elohim is one Eloah, in Shamayim above, and in the earth beneath, and apart from him there is none else. How then have you dared to say that there is any other Elohim besides him, who is the Yahuwah of the Yahudim. And again, the scripture says, Behold, to Yahuwah your Elohim belong the Shemaim, and the Shemaim of Shemaim, the earth and all things that are there in them. Nevertheless, I have chosen your fathers that I might love them and you after them. Thus, that judgment is supported by the scripture on every side, that he who created the world is the true and only Elohim. All right, and I think that'll be a, a nice place to stop there. We'll have to continue next time with their continued disputation, but Abba willing, that was beneficial and edifying for us all. I think it's always awesome in particular, in this reading, we went over Kepha's intentions for when he says shalom to the people, how to have proper disputations or conversations with like-minded believers in shalom to discover what's true, and also how to soundly refute through patience and love the advances of the enemy which we'll continue to see. So it's really amazing. I love, I love going over these things. It, you'll see the accolades that Clement gives as well, but to be able to see his Ruach in a man in action is always inspiring. So it's always beneficial to me, and, and I, I'm hoping, I pray, that it will also be so for you. So thank you all for your time, and you have a wonderful Shabbat, Shavuot Tom, and or... or a wonderful week to come, and we will see you next time.